Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am setting up the Facebook Live for this episode. So just give me a few minutes to get everything set up. And I can stream it live on Facebook. Let's get started in about five minutes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm just going to take a few minutes to start sharing uh, this Facebook Live um, with all the groups so people can start to join us. So just give me one or two minutes and then we'll get started in a second. Thanks for your patience. I sincerely appreciate it. <laughs> That's funny. That was Kari's dog. <laughs> You're watching Kari. Okay, just a second. Um, let's see. Okay, so if you're just joining me, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, just give me one moment. I'm going to go ahead and stream uh, this across all the Facebook groups and then we'll get started in just about two minutes. Thank you for your patience. So if you're just joining, uh, thank you for coming. Welcome to Grassroots Voices. We're gonna be getting started in just a few minutes. I am sharing this episode across the Facebook groups and I wanna give um, people a time to, some time to hop on and then we will get started. So just thank you for your patience and we'll get going in one moment. So I did just pin this episode to the top of the Team Stacey Abrams Grassroots page. So um, feel free to like and share this episode, that'd be great. And then I'm gonna go ahead and keep on sharing this across the Facebook groups, give people a chance to hop on. We have wonderful guests today. I'm really excited to talk about uh, plan, Planned Parenthood Reproductive Rights and share what's happening across the Southeast as many of these states are being are under attack uh, regarding reproductive health. So it'll be great to speak with our guest today. So give me about two minutes and then we'll get going. So if you're just joining, thank you for coming. Um, we are going live um, across the Facebook groups and I just need um, a second to share, share this episode across the Facebook group. So we'll be getting started in one minute. Uh, thanks for your patience.
So again, if you're just joining us, we're going to get started in a few minutes. I am sharing uh, this Facebook Live across the Facebook groups, and then we will get going very soon. So just give me about one or two more minutes. I am trying to share as fast as I can. But again, we have some fabulous guests and I'm super excited to speak with them and talk about the work that they've been doing. So give me one more minute and I think we'll be ready to get started. Thanks for coming. Please like, please share the episode, tag people. Um, if you like, tag them in the comments, check out the comments. Uh, we are posting um, a lot of different, um, a lot of links that are from different episodes uh, that we've done and different calls to action. So please check out the comment section. And again, please like or share this episode. So 30 more seconds. And I think I will have hit most of our sister groups and other people in our Facebook, Facebook network. Okay. All right. Let's get going. So hello, welcome to Grassroots Voices with Robin and Friends, uh, where community and politics meet. I'm Robin, and I'm excited to uh, share with you the many voices of people in the grassroots community who are doing wonderful political work and social justice work and uh, just everyday people who are change agents putting the work in. I wanted to create a space to uplift their voices, elevate the work they're already doing out there, um, and also to build coalitions with one another. So that was the, uh, the inspiration and the intention behind Grassroots Voices. So we're on our 11th episode uh, as of today. We launched uh, August 13th, uh, and then you know we've only been around for a couple of months, and we've had episodes every week. We've had amazing guests. I'm probably going to do a recap show um, in the coming weeks uh, just to kind of refresh and remind those people of the calls to action that we uh, committed to. And, and then also, if you haven't seen some of these episodes or um, if you haven't touched on some of these subjects, you can uh, know what's out there. So very excited today. Uh, we're going to be joined by Lauren Frazier, Director of Communications with Planned Parenthood Southeast. And we're also gonna be uh, joined by Bev Jackson, Jackson, a board member um, of Planned Parenthood Southeast as well. So uh, looking forward to speaking with them. Um, but I like to start off the show with uh, a few videos uh, of things that happened this week um, as far as voting rights, uh, as well as if you missed it, uh, Senator Warnock, he uh, introduced the John Lewis uh, uh, Advancement Act into Congress about a week or so ago. I have more updates on that um, as we go forward, but I like to start off with, again, a few videos to just kind of update you what's been happening this past week, and then that also gives more time for people to hop on, and then we'll get started from there with uh, our guest. Okay. Sorry. Our first video is Senator Warnock introducing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Of the great state of Georgia and a voice for our state here in this chamber, I am deeply honored to join my colleagues here today to introduce this important legislation in honor of one of Georgia's and America's most influential public servants. I'm grateful uh, for the comments of Senator Blumenthal uh, and I want to thank Senator Leahy and all of my colleagues for their leadership in introducing this bill that carries on the legacy of Congressman Lewis's pivotal work to protect the sacred right to vote. John Lewis was my parishioner. And as I stand in support of this legislation named in his honor, I think of the many conversations I had with him over the years. I think of the Sunday mornings we boarded a bus taking souls to the polls because I believe that voting as he did is a sacred undertaking. At root, it is about people's voice. And in that sense, it's about 
one's humanity. I learned so much from Congressman Lewis and the lessons from his lived experiences, working deep in the trenches to defend and advance voting rights, he laid it all on the line. When President Johnson took his pen and signed this legislation, making it law in a real sense, what he etched had already been affirmed in blood. The risk that John Lewis took, the ultimate sacrifice that others made as they lost their lives, fighting for the vote, the voice, the humanity of every child of God. And one of the most important tools that came out of that activism, that came out of that human sacrifice, one of the most important tools in this legislation is the process of preclearance. This process required that jurisdictions with a proven history of voting rights violations get approval from the Department of Justice or our federal courts before making changes to local voting administration. And for decades, this was the tool that helped enfranchise countless voters, ensure that they would have access to the ballot, to exercise their constitutional right. And it kept some of the worst voter suppression efforts at bay. And then in 2013, The Supreme Court in Shelby versus Holder asked the Congress to update the coverage formula that determines which states are subject to preclearance. The Supreme Court said that this preclearance formula had somehow been updated, outdated. And Congress ought to bring it up to date. That's what they asked us to do in 2013. Since then, Congress has been unwilling to act. Preclearance has been allowed to atrophy, and we've seen the results, not only in Georgia, but in Texas, in Arizona, in Pennsylvania, all across our country. Earlier this year in Georgia, state leaders enacted a voter suppression law that will undoubtedly make it harder for some people to vote. If the tool of preclearance were in place right now, SB 202 in Georgia likely would not even be on the books. I think. We're gonna stop here for now. Um, I'm, I'll play the rest of it towards the uh, end of the show. Uh, because I do want to um, also play uh, one more uh, video that came out this week. Uh, Lauren Grow Wargo, she is the uh, CEO of Fair Fight Action, and she also put out a statement um, this past week about why it is so important that we call our senators and, and demand that they pass voting rights, um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. So let's hear a little bit from Lauren and then we'll get into our guest for today's show. This is the fight, frankly, of our lifetime. Trump operation sort of took it to a new level that is now, you know, getting moved around the country. So I want people to understand, yes, we need those federal bills passed.
these conspiracy theorists and radical elements of the far right GOP have become mainstream and they are using these ideas that are both fundamentally rooted in racism to organize their folks at the grassroots level. And they're trying to move people into school board positions as an intentional strategy who are there to question diversity initiatives, question cultural competency in teaching, question and restrain teachers from teaching our true country's history. That is happening all over the country. And those same elements that are funding that are also funding grass tops and grassroots efforts to do similar organizing in local boards of elections. I want people to think about these bills as tools. They don't solve racism. They don't solve voter suppression. They give tools to voters, elections officials, advocates and lawyers to defend and protect the right to vote. You can be sure that should these bills pass, we're gonna see a whole new slate of legislation in the state legislatures that come back together in January, a whole bunch of red state governors and attorney generals filing lawsuits. Uh, that's a big part of this conversation. So no matter what, we all collectively have to do tons of voter education and tons of voter protection activities next year. Senate uh, Judiciary Committee introduced the updated Senate version of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act that passed through the House just this August. And so August to early October, that's how fast it moved through the Senate. No one thought we could win Georgia. We knew we could. And look, we have a senator in his 30s who's a Jewish man. We have a black pastor from the South and they are out there every day. They give me hope, to be honest. <laughs> Things can happen. Um, for the good of all of us, and I'm very hopeful that we will be able to find a way next year. Awesome. Yes, hope floats. So thank you, Lauren. All right, so if you're just joining us, uh, welcome to Grassroots Voices with Robin and Friends. Uh, I'm Robin. Uh, I'm excited today to introduce you uh, to our guest uh, from the Planned Parenthood here in the Southeast region. Um, so please, again, like and share this episode. Uh, you know, invite people, comment, um, you know, um, if you want to tag people and, and have them join in the episode later, um, that's that'd be great. Um, again, if you don't know already, uh, I'm one of the founders of the team Stacey Abrams Grassroots Facebook group. So please join our, our, our group. The links are in the comments. Uh, we also have uh, many sister groups, Team Georgia Blue, Stacey Abrams Fair Fight Club, Stacey Abrams for President, A Blue Georgia for a Stronger and Progressive America, Envoys for Humanity, Disability and Democracy, and the Rural Progressive and Afro Southeast Georgian. So those are a bunch of um, Facebook groups that are sister groups. Again, the links are in the comments. And again, uh, we share um, some similar information, but then a lot of information um, is new because there's different members in each group. So make sure to take advantage of that. I already went through that. Uh, so I'm really excited because this episode, we're going to be speaking with uh, two powerhouses from uh, Planned Parenthood Southeast. We're gonna learn about the work that they've been doing uh, is around reproductive health in the South, as well as some of the trainings and programs that Planned Parenthood Southeast are offering. And so if you wanna get involved and support them or support your community, that would be fantastic. That's the whole point of the show. We're also going to speak with them about how to combat some of the anti-reproductive health laws and legislation that we're seeing um, rolled out across the country. So let's go ahead and meet our guest. We're going to be joined today by Lauren Frazier, Director of Communications with Planned Parenthood Southeast, and Bev Jackson, Jackson, board member of Planned Parenthood. So Bev Jackson, uh, she was recently elected to the board of directors of Planned Parenthood Southeast. She's a longtime community activist a legend, and at least to me, and she worked for the Elizabeth Warren for President campaign and the Stacey Abrams for Governor campaign. She's also a, a part of the North Georgia Community Outreach. Um, she's a lead for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and she's a former educator and broadcast journalist. 
And we'll be joined also by Lauren Frazier. She's the Director of Communications and Marketing at Planned Parenthood Southeast. Uh, under her leadership, she manages a team responsible for executing the organization's integrated communications, marketing, and social impact strategy. Lauren protects and strengthens Planned Parenthood Southeast reputation by guiding external, internal, executive, and digital communications. Um, she's also uh, handling the strategic marketing, branding, and corporate responsibility. Lauren earned a dual undergraduate degree in business marketing and management from Georgia State University and a master's in international business from Clayton State University. With over 10 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, she has a deep passion for working with organizations focused on improving the quality of life for communities across the South and beyond. So I am so excited to introduce you all to um, Ms. Bev, Bev Jackson, Jackson and Lauren Frazier. So I'm gonna go ahead and have them enter the room. So we'll just give them a moment. Okay, I think Lauren and Bev is joining us. So we'll give them a second to hop on. Wonderful, welcome. There we go. Hi, Hi, Lauren. Welcome to Grassroots Voices. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Sure. I think Bev is connecting in. Okay. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome, Bev. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. Let me un unmute you. Okay. Uh, there you go. Welcome, Bev. Thank you for coming. Sure, sure. Yes. Yeah, so it's so wonderful to see both of you. And uh, I'm really excited to just uh, share with people today just about the work, um, Planned Parenthood Southeast, what you all are, are doing out here, especially just under the circumstances of all of the legislation um, that's being rolled out across the country and just letting people know, um, you know, why you're doing what you're doing, why Planned Parenthood is so important. And then maybe we can also talk a little bit about, you know, what personally, you know, brought you into this, this work. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So let's see, Lauren, I'm going to start maybe with you, if you could just, because I know a lot of people hear about Planned Parenthood, but they don't, I mean, even me, I'm learning when I was, you know, doing some research for the show, but I know, you know, people hear Planned Parenthood and a lot of times, you know, no, we should support Planned Parenthood, but I know that you're doing a lot more than, you know, just, you know, only work around reproductive um, health, but also, you know, talking about why that is extremely important to everybody. Yeah, sure. So Planned Parenthood Southeast, which is the affiliate that I work with, provides uh, high quality, affordable health care, as you mentioned, um, to people in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Um, so we actually first, um, our first affiliate was formed in Birmingham in 1930. Um, mm -hmm. And then our, our Atlanta affiliate was formed in 1964. Um, and then in 1989, our Mississippi health uh, centers um, were started in uh, 89. But it wasn't until 2010 when all three of those combined under the umbrella of Planned Parenthood Southeast. And from there, we've continued our commitment to the work of you know, the health of all people um, across the Deep South. Um, and so there's really four main pillars of our work. We focus, um, as I mentioned, on comprehensive reproductive health care, but um, we are also one of the largest providers of sex education in the country. Um, we have a wonderful sex ed program uh, here at our affiliate. Um, and we also, um, you know, do a lot of advocacy work. So I think when people think about Planned Parenthood Southeast, they often either peg, peg us as being a sex, um, you know, uh, reproductive healthcare provider or as a political advocacy organization. And the truth is we are both equally. Um, and then we also uh, do a lot of work um, in the community as far as research. And so we're really focused on, um, you know, uh, the advancement of reproductive health care um, 
so we actually have a partnership with Emory University where we're just studying some of the uh, major reproductive health care issues that plague our communities across the Southeast. And our goal is um, to just be a part of, you know, improving the outcomes for folks here. Yeah, okay. And then Bev, maybe do you wanna talk a little bit about, I guess, you know, what? why did you decide to, you know, start doing work for parent, pa Planned Parenthood and also just lending your time and energy and was, you know, any specific service or what did you seem to, to think was important for our communities when it came to Planned Parenthood at Southeast? Um, well, I'll tell you, thank you, Robin for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to have joined um, uh, or been invited to join the board of uh, Planned Parenthood Southeast, the board of directors. Um, the work for me is coming full circle to some degree. Um, I was involved with Planned Parenthood during my first job out of college. Uh, this was in Ohio. And this was the year that I joined Toledo Planned Parenthood. Um, was five years after um, Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. um, and there were still just violent protests everywhere. And there was the bombing of a clinic in Akron, Ohio, that just pushed, um, just elevated the work of Planned Parenthood in Ohio and of course in Toledo. And I got involved, um, you know, it pushed us into the streets to march to say what's going on, this has got to stop. Women have the right to make their own decisions, to control their bodies. And um, as I've told people before, we used to wear little uh, gold coat hangers around our necks um, as like a necklace. It was a fundraiser actually for Planned Parenthood Toledo. And uh, we wore that around as a symbol that we were not going back. We did not want to go back to those horrific days. And what concerns me is now, um, I don't want to say how many years ago that was, but it was a little over 40 years ago. And here we are tragically, almost in the very same situation, same fight, still fighting for our rights, still fighting to have control over our own bodies. And it is just kind of unbelievable that we are back almost where we were mm -hmm. when I was first in this fight um, when I got right out of college. So I think what drives me is uh, probably what drives most people who work for Planned Parenthood is just the basic notion of freedom. Um, women deserve freedom. You know, people deserve freedom. And we definitely deserve freedom. Um, a person, a couple, a family, um, they should be left alone to decide um, whether they want to expand their family, whether they... Um, want to uh, end a pregnancy. I mean, this is, this is a personal, very complicated decision to be made by the people involved and their doctor and perhaps even their um, faith leader if they want to. But that's it. Uh, legislators have no business uh, in this fight. Um, and I saw one of the most impactful signs um, at the at the Women's March in North Fulton a few weeks ago. And I hope I have it right, but it said something like, name a law that governs a man's body. Mm. <laughs> right. And I thought, you know, think about that. Mm. Let's think about that. Is there a law out there that governs what a man can do with his body? I don't think so. Uh, nor should there be laws um, that govern what we can and cannot do. So I'm in this fight because at the root of it and at the base of it is just freedom. And um, that is always gonna be a fight that you know people of color are familiar with um, and women uh, are familiar with. So here I am, I'm in the fight and I've come full circle. Wow. Oh, sorry, you're gonna say something, Lauren? Yeah, I just want to piggyback a little bit off of what Bev uh, mm -hmm. said, because she made some really great points. Um, and I thought I'd, you know, use this as a segue to share a few data uh, points with you, right? So let's start with the first point that one in four women will have an abortion in her lifetime. Um, and uh, 
let's be clear, no amount of anti-abortion protesting or policy making is gonna change the fact that abortion is essential health care, right? Um, when a person decides that they don't wanna continue a pregnancy, they're gonna figure out a way to end that pregnancy. Abortion bans, they don't stop, uh, you know, abortion. They only stop safe legal abortion. Um, so that's the one thing I really want folks to take away from here. And the other thing, uh, I want to share another data point with you. One in five women um, has relied on a Planned Parenthood Health Center for Care in her lifetime. Um, and so what this data point is showing is that people really do understand the critical role that Planned Parenthood plays in providing comprehensive expert reproductive health care services throughout our community. I mean, for many people, Planned Parenthood is literally their only source of care. Um, and a lot of communities, especially rural communities, um, where, you know, uh, health centers and hospitals are few and far between. Um, and I think in that sense, that makes Planned Parenthood health centers a really uh, irreplaceable component of this country's healthcare system. And as experts in the reproductive health care space, um, you know, we feel a gap where family planning services and other safety net providers um, simply aren't able to. Um, and I, I think the other thing, um, the other point that Bev hit on was that, you know, without Planned Parenthood, uh, a lot of people would have nowhere else to turn for care. So we're talking about those who already face um, systemic barriers to access to health care, including people of color, including right. people with low incomes, as well as those in rural areas um, who are always the first ones to be disproportionately impacted by these sorts of laws. And people forget sometimes also, um, great what you said, Lauren, people forget about the range of services that Planned Parenthood offers. When you talk about uh, no clinic being nearby or no hospital, being nearby. I mean, we're talking about everything from um, diagnosing STDs. There's clinics who actually give mammograms. Um, there's just regular women's uh, health exam. There's, of course, uh, birth control, sex education, as she said. I mean, there's such a range of services that Planned Parenthood offers, and it's affordable, quality care. And yes, Abortion is one of those things, and that is, in fact, the lightning rod, and that is what has been under attack since Roe v. Wade. But I want folks to also keep in mind that Planned Parenthood offers women a place to go for many kinds of health care, and that's, that's important to remember as well when we think about those clinics coming under attack or those clinics not being able to operate. Um, and of course, the impact on women of color, and as she said, uh, women in rural areas and low income women, you know, it's, it's something, you know, it, it has quite an impact on these women's lives. And then you, when you add in abortion and trying to decide uh, what to do in terms of pregnancy and that not being there, mm. that is just, that's beyond unfortunate. As I said earlier, it's just tragic. It's just tragic. And there have been 600 pieces of restrictive legislation introduced in this year alone across the country. This is the worst year. Um, you know, the Texas law, the Georgia heartbeat bill, um, everything that's been coming about, 600 pieces. I mean, that people have been hard at work trying to figure out how to take control of women's reproductive rights. And um, it's got to stop because as we as we yelled and marched a few weeks ago, we will not go back. We're not going back, so. Uh, it's just, it's so cruel, you know, when you hear about, it, especially, you know, in, in, in some of the, the Southern states, you know, that we're, you know, we're all in Georgia, but in some of the Southern states, you know, these governors won't expand um, Medicaid. And then, so you have that, then you have um, here in Georgia, I showed a video a couple of weeks ago with Senator Ossoff, how he was saying, you know, um, 10 hospitals close, you know, within, uh, you know, 10, 15 year span uh, in Georgia. So, you know, there's people who live in these rural communities or just communities where, you know, like you said, they don't have healthcare access and they have to drive 
hours uh, to be able to even see anybody. Um, so it's just, it's, so it's great, you know, that Planned Parenthood can, you know, not even fill the gap because it's such a wide gap, you know, in regards mm-hmm. to healthcare, but to even provide those services and then to have, you know, those clinics under siege plus the legislation. I mean, it's just, it, it's so cruel, you know, when, to think about. Um, do you have any, you know, as far as uh, specifically, you know, in the South, um, how people are being, um, I mean, what are people doing, I guess, like if they're, you know, if they're not coming to Planned Parenthood or they don't have access, then what what options do they have? Yeah. Um, so for example, let's talk about the Texas SB8 uh, law that the Supreme Court allowed to go into effect last September, right? So this is one of the most extreme uh, abortion bans that we've seen ever um, enacted here in this country. Um, and it has essentially um, outright uh, banned abortion um, in that state for folks who, you know, many times at six weeks don't even know that they're pregnant yet, right? The other thing that this law has done was deputize private citizens, right, by uh, declaring that they can sue anybody, right, who gets an abortion or anybody who, um, you know, aids and abets someone with getting care and get a $10,000 reward for it. Um, so beyond that ridiculousness, mm-hmm. right, now we're talking about um, abortion clinics in the state who, by the way, up until like the last minute before this law went into effect, were fighting and pushing to provide abortion care to people until the very last second, right? Mm-hmm. But once that clock, that clock uh, struck 12, right, and they could no longer um, provide abortion care, what they now, they went from being um, abortion healthcare providers to being call centers, right? Mm -hmm. So they're taking in calls from hundreds of women, thousands of people across the state who are desperate, who are afraid, who, you know, aren't sure where they're going to go to get the care that they need. And so now they are working very closely with Um, neighboring abortion uh, clinics in nearby states, um, and also with abortion funds to uh, help people travel out of the state to get the care that they need. And it's just honestly ridiculous. But that's the reality of Texas right now. And that's the importance of the work that Planned Parenthood is providing. That's the importance of the work that our reproductive justice partners are providing in this space is to make sure that people can access the care that they need, right? So what we're seeing right now is a preview of what a post-Roe world would look like uh, in Texas. Mm -hmm. And if Mm -hmm. abortion Mm -hmm. is overturned, Um, If Roe v. Wade is overturned at some point in this country, that's going to mean at least half of the country, 26 states will no longer, um, you know, folks in those states will no longer be able to access care. Um, So just imagine that, right? That's like 36 million women, including trans women um, and LGBTQ community, um, folks who won't be able to get the care that they need. So it's, it's serious. And as you said, Lauren, I mean, people uh, who and and who gets hurt in this the most? Uh, pe- low income, people of color, brown, black, indigenous. Um, if you have money, mm-hmm. um, and I heard one of my favorite uh, legislators state say this the other week: if you have money, you can still get an abortion. You can travel to another state where it is safe and where it is legal. But if you don't have money and you have no monetary assistance, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, you know, you're you're in a position of having to perhaps carry the child uh, to the end of the term, to term. And um, there are people who are not in the decision, in, in, in in the place where they can do that for whatever reason. And it's not my business, it's not your business, it's not Lauren's business, whatever the reason is. But, you know, I'm not going to try to second guess 
someone else's um, decision on this because it's far too difficult and far too complicated. And the Texas law is just so out of this world. And the whole notion of, of people being able to sue folks who aid and abet. So, you know, I, a friend of mine told me she saw something on television the other day where the woman was like, well, I thought I'd call Uber. And then I thought, well, no, will the Uber driver report me? Will he try to collect the $10,000? I mean, who do you trust? Mm -hmm. You know, I saw this horrible comic strip where the guy is hugging his girlfriend and he says, so, you know, so we'll do this and then we'll collect the $10,000. And I thought, what? So, I mean, it is a horrible position um, for a woman to be put in. And, and, and Texas is just, they have gone, they have gone so far. And now we're waiting now for Mississippi, right, Lauren? We're waiting That's to correct. see what happens with um, the lawsuit in Mississippi that the Supreme Court um, will hear. And it's really thought that that lawsuit, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Center, I think I have that correct. Um, that's the one. They're saying that's the one wow. that's really going to, to overturn Roe. That's the one that's going to cause Roe to be overturned. And you know what? I frankly just don't see it happening. I think women are going to take to the streets. I think women are going to shut this country down. Uh, we are a little over 50% of the country. And if this is your fight and you're in it, I think things are going to get very, very interesting should this uh, proceed the way a lot of folks want it to go. We, we can't go back to those days and we're not going to go back. I think when there are women out there who um, won't let that happen. Um, and uh, I'm one of them. You're one of them, I'm sure Lauren's one of them. And we've all got friends and they've got friends and they've got friends and they've got friends. And this movement, um, I think is really going to uh, catch on fire, mm -hmm. totally catch on fire if, if uh, things keep going down this track. Yeah, yeah, um, Bev is absolutely right. Um, I have another data point I'd like to share with you since I, I like data and I like yeah, facts. I, I love data. Say. Right. So 80 percent of people, 80 percent of people in this country believe that Roe v. Wade should remain intact. They believe that people should have access to safe legal abortion. So what the Supreme Court allowed to happen in Texas, not only was it completely unprecedented, but it's also against the will of the people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, since that happened on September 1st, um, since SB8 went into effect, we've just been seeing this ping pong game happening back and forth between the courts and abortion providers. Um, so two weeks ago, Judge Robert Pittman, um, who serves on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas, actually granted a preliminary injunction um, that was requested by the Department of Justice to block enforcement of Texas's six-week abortion ban. Mm -hmm. um, and he literally called it an offensive deprivation of such an important right. Okay, less than 48 hours mm -hmm. after the injunction was put in place, Texas's six week abortion uh, ban was back in effect, right? So um, the Fifth Circuit ended up granting a temporary administrative stay of the injunction um, to consider the state's request for a longer stay of appeal. Just yesterday, y'all. Mm -hmm the mm -hmm. Justice Department filed an emergency application asking the Supreme Court to block Texas's six-week abortion ban. So I'm saying all of this to say is that there is still a long road ahead to restoring and protecting abortion access in Texas. Um, and it could literally be years before we see abortion access in Texas fully restored. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that it's not just Texas. Texas is not the only state where abortion access is at risk. Um, you know, last month, Planned Parenthood Southeast and some of our partners, Sister Song, Feminist Women's Health Center, we were back in court in Georgia over Governor Kemp's HB 481 six week abortion ban. Um, and, uh, you know, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals 
actually said that they won't make a ruling in this case until after the Supreme Court makes a decision in Mississippi's 15 week abortion ban um, next year. Uh, so literally for the past 50 years, right, Roe v. Wade has been the law of the land and now mm -hmm. All of a sudden, we have this case in Mississippi, Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, um, that could literally roll back our reproductive rights to pre-1973 levels when people were literally dying for the right to choose. Um, so, you know, I think it's safe to say that right now, abortion rights are literally hanging by a thread in this country. Um, and so we've got some work to do. We have to get organized yeah, ahead of legislative do. session. We have yeah. to get louder and we have to move with purpose yeah. Um, yeah. because the so. consequences of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, living in a world where half of the country is unable to access abortion care, it's, it's going to be devastating. Yeah. Now, what's important to remember as mm -hmm. we're waiting next year for the Supreme Court's ruling in the Mississippi case is that right now in Georgia, abortion is still legal, it's safe, it's affordable. So we want people to remember that. But Lauren is right, we've got to get organized ahead of this 2022 election. Um, we need to get to know our legislators. And I think actually better than that, they need to get to know us. Um, and what we stand for and what we want. Um, we have to go, we need to start looking at legislators and see where they stand on these issues. You know, it's a lot easier to not help someone get into office who's going to totally go against everything you believe in than it is to get that person out of office. So I think there needs to be some checks and balances and some good conversations had uh, with candidates, not just current legislators, but with candidates about where they stand and what they believe, um, and just see if we can figure out how we get people in office who will also help us um, maintain what we have. We don't want, we definitely don't want to lose that. Um, and there are about, what, 36,000 abortions performed in this state. Um, since I think 2017 was the last that number, but you know, we've got to we've got to make sure we know who's representing us. We've got to make sure they know what we're interested in, what we want, um, and go from there. No, you're absolutely right, and I'm glad because I was going to ask, you know, just tying this all back to voting because again, who's you know, who is president, who's appointing someone to the Department of Justice, who are the judges that are being, you know, appointed and elected. And then, as you were saying, uh, the uh, members of Congress and our state legislatures and, you know, people can and can also stand on an issue. But then are they really going to fight for us? You know, once they're in there or really fight for that issue um, mm -hmm. is important to know, um, too. Were you going to say something, Lauren? Uh, no, but oh. um, I will. <laughs> I was just nodding in agreement, but I will um, just add that um, you're absolutely right. Um, all elections matter. Um, and all of these, you know, we, we, it's our job, right, um, to make sure that we protect our interests. So that includes electing uh, reproductive health champions who are that we can put into play, who can eventually help us elect judges to the Supreme Court, which by the way, these are lifetime seats, right? Um, who are gonna make sure that our interests are, you know, fully and completely represented. Um, you know, literally what we're seeing right now is, uh, you know, the consequences of a court, a Supreme Court packed by Trump with, you know, a bunch of conservative judges Mm -hmm. um and this is the result right so um you know whenever an election comes up it's our job to make sure that we raise our voices and that we hit the polls um and that we elect the people who need to be put in place to represent our communities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I did hear a story um, this past week about, you know, so we're living in this world where, or in this country where, you know, a woman's 
health and her choice, you know, this is under attack, all this legislation, and then even, you know, violence at times around around this issue. And then we're also living in a world where there was a story about um, a woman who was raped on the subway um, in New York City, and people were just standing by, didn't do anything. You know, mm -hmm. so how do you, you know, it's like, how are we reconciling, you know, what's what's going on here? So you have, you know, these instances and then you have, you know, if this woman becomes pregnant, what options does she have? She's already under trauma. And then now she's under the trauma of having, you know, to make these choices. And then, you know, you have these laws and uh, legislation out there to take, take her choice away, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's really, I mean, it's, it's real life. It's, it's really cruel. Um, and it's, it's something again, like you are, we're all saying we have to get organized. We have to vote we municipal do. voting, you know, is going on now, you know, here in Georgia and, you know, across the country. So, you know, voting on your local elections and again, making sure that we're, you know, finding people that can represent us. And if they're not either voting them out or finding candidates who will, you know, be out there fighting for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And having a conversation uh, is the first step. And I've, I've been on that side of advocacy with Moms Demand Action, you know, going to the Capitol, standing at the rope line, trying to get people to come out. And some do, and some don't. And some you chase into the elevator and you have to try to continue your conversation in there. And then there are others who say, hey, come to my office, let's talk. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we don't know what's gonna happen then, but at least they're saying, let's talk. And mm -hmm. I think that's really what, what has to happen. And people really need to see how lopsided this is. Uh, even legislators, as I said, is there some, is there a law out there that regulates men's bodies? I don't think so. So so how how did we get here? This is the 21st century. How did we get here or back here? I should say. So um, I think getting organized around this election um, is very important. People can also volunteer with Planned Parenthood. Before I spoke at the Women's March, actually, I met with Lauren and I said, you know, I want to know. I, we need some call to actions here. You know, what, what can I tell folks that they can do? And um, she talked with me about the different things and it includes donating to Planned Parenthood. It includes volunteering with this organization or another reproductive um, rights organization, if you wish. But giving your time, giving your energy, um, that can go a long way too. Um, and also, um, share your story. I mean, share your story. Your story can make a difference in your life. And, and as she said, one in four women um, will have an abortion in, the, in their lifetime. So what that really means is somebody in your circle right now probably has had an abortion. Mm -hmm. So share your story, whatever it is. My story was just, out, just outrage general outrage at a clinic being bombed, people being hurt, hurt and injured. Um, and just, we can't, you know, Roe v. Wade is in place. I'm like, what the heck's going on? How, what, why is this going on? So whatever your story is, tell your story too. Tell it in your circle. Uh, get people uh, involved, get them engaged, give them upset, mm -hmm. you know, get them upset if that's what it takes. Um, to get folks to the point where, where this fight um, is something that we know is winnable. Um, and it has to be, it really has to be. Um, I can't tell you how I would feel if, if what Lauren has talked about happens, if there ends up being 26 states where you can, I mean, my God, that's like when I first came out of college. Mm -hmm. I mean, people were grappling with this then. I, I, cannot, I, I cannot see, that happening again. And I also think today's woman mm -hmm. isn't about that anymore. Mm -hmm. I just don't think we're going to stand for that, you know? So uh, my hope is that we do get organized around the election, get to know our legislators, get to know our candidates, that we do volunteer our time when and where we can, that we do donate um, to help. Um, because as Lauren said, we don't have Medicaid to cover costs for women uh, for abortions. So, uh, you know, and, and 
this is a total aside, but I almost fell off my chair. I was watching, uh, you're gonna say, why is she going down this rabbit hole? But I was, I was watching, I'm the last one to see it, okay? My sister said, everybody's seen it, I'm the last one. I was watching Surviving R. Kelly the other night, okay? And one of those mini girls that he supposedly has had locked up and whatever, mm -hmm. talked about when she got pregnant. Mm -hmm. And she said, so, you know, I told him and blah, blah, blah. And then she said, so we went to Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, oh my God, Planned Parenthood is in the Surviving R. Kelly documentary. But she said, you know, we went somewhere, she had to get the money together. We went somewhere where it was affordable and blah, blah, blah. You know, and I thought, well, how about that? How about that? When you talk about Planned Parenthood reaching out and touching a range of people, that's it right there. That's it right there. So extremely important. And then um, Lauren, did you have any, uh, we're going to be dropping in the links uh, at the sign up to donate as well as volunteer, but anything specific calls to action or anything you wanted to highlight? Beth hit the nail on the head. Um, I know right now, like she mentioned, we are super focused on um, getting stories, collecting stories from folks. We're pushing them out on social media. We're like, you know, sending them to legislators and like, look, these are the real people um, that are being impacted by these bad, um, you know, bills. And honestly, like all of this is the result of abortion stigma. So yeah, mm -hmm. talk to your friends, talk to your family about it because, you know, as she mentioned, you know, one in four people can get pregnant, will have an abortion in their lifetime, which means that we all know and love somebody who's mm -hmm. had an abortion. Mm -hmm. So it's time for us to speak up, to speak out, to get loud um, and mm -hmm. get rid of the shame and stigma um, that is fueling these sorts of uh, policies that are going to have impacts on our on our generation and on generations to come um, for years down the line. Um, and we can't afford, uh, like Beth mentioned, to go back and we won't. Yeah, we won't. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. And that's, you know, for me, uh, I knew someone um, and I, I was a young woman. I went with um, someone in my life who uh, had to, who was date raped and, um, and she ended up pregnant and then she, you know, had to get an abortion and, you know, Planned Parenthood was the only, you know, really the only thing available, um, you know, for that person at the time. And, uh, you know, there's just, it was already, you know, the trauma, of being raped. And then, you know, there were other outstanding, you know, issues, you know, in her life where that was not going to be, you know, possible for her to carry the baby and have the baby and everything. So, um, so absolutely. Uh, so many people have been impacted, uh, or they know someone who has, so thank you so much. I want you all definitely, you know, to come back because I know, you know, there's going to be developments, um, throughout, you know, over the next year, uh, or so. So please, I hope you all will, come back and, um, you know, just share any updates or um, anything that we need to be doing or sharing. So thank you again so much for, for coming on the show today. Thank you for having us. This was awesome. Yeah. Thank yes, you. you're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. So everyone, please check the comments. And, uh, you know, again, thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you, Bev, and everyone at Planned Parenthood Southeast. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Have a great evening. You too. too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Okay. So that was great. Um, I'm so glad that everyone was able to join us today um, and hear from Planned Parenthood uh, Southeast. Again, I'm going to um, make sure uh, I drop in the comments, uh, just check the comments section. Uh, we're, we're sharing the link uh, for Planned Parenthood. So please consider donating to them. Or uh, if you can't, you know, donate, see if you can donate your time or energy, donate money, then see if you can donate your time and energy uh, to Planned Parenthood. Uh, it's such an important, uh, such an important issue. And I'm sure we're going to see more about this, you know, as time goes on. 
Uh, so we're going to go back into the show again. Uh, for those of you who aren't here, um, here the last couple of weeks, there is a tour happening as we speak. Stacey Abrams is on tour. Uh, it's called A Conversation with Stacey Abrams. Uh, she's going to various uh, cities across the country and not just like large cities like Chicago, New York, LA, but uh, you know, or even Atlanta, but, um, you know, smaller markets. Uh, so if you get a chance to uh, catch her, please do. Uh, you know, she's wonderful to hear in person. And I'm sure she's going to be, uh, you know, rallying the troops around voting rights and passing voting rights and maybe talking about some of her other work that she's been doing here uh, in Georgia and across the country is, and her books uh, because she's written uh, a new book and I think she has a TV show coming out. So if you can catch Stacey Abrams, just go to StaceyAbramsTour.com and you can buy your tickets and uh, see her in person. And that is a huge treat, especially now these days. Um, okay, so you heard uh, at the top of the show, uh, Senator Warnock, uh, he introduced the John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act. There's also the Freedom to Vote Act. So these are two different bills that are on the Senate floor. So it is so important that you call your senator today, right now, if you like. Um, it just takes literally, no joke, like two, three minutes. Um, and if you don't get a chance to do it right this second, do it after the show, but just do it as soon as you can. It's okay if it's after five o'clock or if it's on um, a weekend, but um, I'm just going to read you an update. Uh, here it is. So uh, Senator Warnock, he posted on, uh, I think it was his Twitter, either Facebook page or on Twitter. He said that um, cloture has officially been filed on the Freedom to Vote Act and it will be brought to the Senate floor on Wednesday. So that's tomorrow, Wednesday, October 20th, I believe. Um, he says he's urging every single one of his colleagues to support protecting the integrity of our democracy by voting to advance this critical bill. So we have to call our senators today. And if you're wondering you know, what to say, let them know that, that the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act take the necessary steps to protect our democracy. Um, the Freedom to Vote Act will strengthen national standards for voting access for every American, regardless of uh, your zip code. And it also has overwhelming support from the American people um, across party lines, because this is not something that's only going to impact Black voters, brown voters, youth or Democrats, it's going to impact everybody, regardless of party affiliation, regard regardless if you're in um, well, if you're in a, a red or purple state, you're gonna be probably more impacted, but um, everyone can benefit from the Freedom to Vote Act, regardless if you're in a red, blue, purple state. Um, you can also tell them that it will protect our democracy by making sure that Americans can register to vote, cast a ballot and have that um, ballot counted fairly. So that's why we need both bills passed. So please call 833-465-7142. Um, the Freedom to Vote Fall is through Fair Fight Action. We had, um, um, or Fair Fight had hot call summer. Uh, over 75,000 calls, they said, were made to, to senators um, during the summer. So let's just keep that going. It's okay to call them every day, every other day, you know, keep calling them. I used to work um, in a senator's office uh, a while back, but uh, they keep track of all the calls. And, you know, it's definitely a tally and a list and information that is passed up to the senator. So please, please, please make sure that you are letting your voice be heard. Even if they, if because a lot of people say, oh, I live in a, a blue state and they already support it. I mean, I still call Senator Warnock and Senator Ossoff. Um, you know, you're showing your support so they can confidently go out there and know that they have the American people behind them. Or if you live in a red state or you have, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be nice. Um, but if you have, you know, people like Ted Cruz and Mark Rubio, people like that, who are your senators, people will say, oh, I don't want to call. They're not going to do anything. It's still important for you to call and let them know that you're paying attention as a constituent and that, you're, that your voice matters on this issue. And you tell them what you want them to do because they work for us. So please, again, call your senators today. Also, we are now working hard to make sure that President Biden puts pressure on the Senate to get rid of the filibuster. Um, some people will be like, well, what, what do you expect him to do? We expect him to be president and to, to stand strong, which and we know Joe is strong, President Biden is strong, and we expect him to stand up to the senators and to apply pressure 
and have them eliminate the filibuster in order to get all of this legislation um, passed, you know, issues and things that we voted for on climate change, voting rights, housing, all of these things. Uh, you know, it's important that we start to erode and get rid of this um, uh, filibuster because it's standing in the way of everything. And so we are asking people when the White House um, comment line opens, and it's fine, they want to hear your comments. So the comment line opens um, every couple of days for a couple of hours. It's a, a phone number that you can call. Um, so 888-724-8746 is the number to call. And all you're doing is just leaving a comment, encouraging President Biden to put that pressure on the Senate to eliminate the filibuster because of all the issues that are at stake. So President Obama used to always say, you know, on certain things that, uh, you know, he's not going to, you know, just do them, you know, but we have to uh, keep the political will, the will of the people, the political will of the people, keep that pressure on him um, in order for him to know what we want and to be able to get, you know, certain things done. So we have to, pro pro um, we have to apply that political pressure and political will on President Biden to keep pushing to eliminate the filibuster. So again, 888-724-8746. And then next week, I'm so excited because I will be joined by Vote Riders. Uh, if you haven't heard of them, I believe they're based out of uh, California, but they've been doing work in uh, Georgia, North Carolina, um, Texas, Arizona, Florida, you know, the, the, the Sun Belt states, swing states right now, as well as other parts of the South. But, and they also did a, a ton of work um, leading in Wisconsin, leading up to this last uh, presidential election. So I'll be joined by two staffers uh, from Vote Writers, and they're going to talk about the work that they do to help people get voter IDs. So, you know, again, a lot of, you know, it's not, there's not uniform um, rules and laws and things on the book across the country for when people go to vote regarding voter ID. So, you know, there's some states where you don't have to show ID or, you know, or you have more choices of the kind of ID that you can show. In other states, you have to show ID and it's very specific, narrow ID, um, pieces of identification that you can use. It doesn't make sense. It's not fair. It's not equitable. It's not equal. So vote writers, you know, they are out there helping people get voter IDs. There's a ton of reasons why people may not have um, proper identification. Uh, it could be that the DMV was closed in their area and maybe they don't have transportation to be able to get there, or they're just, they don't understand the importance of having, you know, ID. There's all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's money. Um, sometimes people need other um, forms of identification, like birth certificates or a social security card, things like that they may not have or know how to replace um, in order to get um, IDs to be able to vote. So they're going to talk about how you can get involved. They're a fantastic organization. And um, again, they're nonpartisan. So this is helping anybody who's interested in voting. And they're going to talk about their initiative. But if you really want to help um, especially here in Georgia and, you know, states that have had all these voter um, suppression laws, Texas, et cetera. Um, listen to the show next week, go to Vote Writers and, uh, you know, sign up to be a volunteer or to donate or raise awareness around what they're doing because it's absolutely important and critical and they are very targeted in who they're working, who they're helping and how they can work with people to um, get them voter IDs. Next, speaking of voter suppression, Governor Kemp, um, we have to keep the pressure on him to expand Medicaid uh, here in Georgia. We're in the middle of the pandemic uh, still. And uh, as we know, the South was hit very hard. Black and brown communities were hit, hit very hard when it came to um, COVID and when it came to um, lack of access regarding the vaccine and just a lot of disinformation, misinformation in black and brown communities Listen to episode four of Grassroots Voices. Um, I interviewed Shereen Mitchell. She's a data analyst. Uh, she talked a lot about the misinformation campaigns um, targeting um, black and brown communities around COVID um, and how that you know, impacted um, people's health. So in the middle of all of this, Brian Kemp does not want to expand Medicaid. He's turning away uh, almost a half a billion dollars that's supposed to be coming from the federal government um, in, in, regarding um, healthcare. He's turning away that money. Um, he's out here uh, 
spreading rumors and misinformation around a supposed HIV vaccine that does not exist. And he's repeating this over and over again. Um, and so he really not only needs to be stopped, I mean, because we are going to have an opportunity to vote him out next year, but uh, we, we definitely need to keep the pressure on him to expand Medicaid because this is impacting real people's lives. So please, please, please call Brian Kemp if you're in Georgia, 404-656. 1776, and you're asking him to not only expand Medicaid, but put it on the, the legislative agenda. He won't even do that. Anyway, so we have to keep the pressure on Brian Kemp. And almost lastly, uh, we want to send a special shout out to our favorite uh, person from Grassroots Voices, uh, Dante Carter. He came on episode three of Grassroots Voices, and he is running for mayor of Sandy Springs. He's an HBCU grad, went to Florida a University, my alma mater. But we didn't know each other then, but we crossed paths, and I'm just so happy to support him in his run for mayor of Sandy Springs. Uh, he's a, a, a journalist. He's a, a father, entrepreneur. His uh, lovely wife is an OBGYN. She's a doctor here in Georgia, has a, a beautiful family. Uh, in an amazing campaign. It's super diverse and inclusive, and it has such a, a strong uh, spirit about it. And so Dante, you know, he and his family have been attacked, you know, all kind of racial attacks and intimidation that people are trying to do. And he's just been really holding strong and standing with dignity. So if you don't know anything about Dante, I'm going to play a quick video. It's just like a minute long. And it talks about why we have to support Dante. Again, it doesn't matter if you're in Georgia. Doesn't matter if you don't live in Sandy Springs, still supports, you know, good people, $5, $10 grassroots or some volunteer work. Um, please support him. Uh, you can go to his website, DanteForMayor.com. I'll drop it in the comments section. But we, when really good people, public servants run for office, because it's so hard to run for office and it can be so expensive and so many loops um, to jump through, hoops to jump through, um, when someone like Dante runs for office, we all have to get behind him because this is where it begins. So again, please support Dante. And we're going to go ahead and I'm going to share. Okay, I'm going to share with you um, a quick video uh, that tells you why we have to get behind him. I just, just really take some time to just shout out Dante. First of all, many people probably don't know how tirelessly he works, A, for his community, B, for his craft, and C, for his family. He's a man of faith, a man of great integrity. Um, I've known him for several years, and I just, I'm always so in awe by him because he's self-motivated. And when you're an, an integrous person, you move differently than everybody else. You're not motivated by money. You're not motivated by, you know, getting your, your name in, in lights. You're motivated by something deeper, something more concrete. And the word that comes to my mind right now is the word legacy. And so, um, you know, I can tell you all the things about, you know, professionally him working in television news, um, him starting his own business and just breaking away from the pack by doing work within the justice space. But what I feel is most impressive about him is just his simple humanity. He's such a human person and he really brings his heart to everything that he does. And if we all could just simply aspire to just be a tenth of that, we would probably be a much better world. Dante Carter for mayor. So please go to his website, danteformayor.com. Again, we support you, Dante. If you can give him any time on the doors, um, if you're here in Georgia, or if you want to come to Georgia, come to Sandy Springs. Uh, the election is November 2nd. So of course, they're in the middle of um, GOTV, get out the vote phase of the campaign. Uh, and people are early voting. So again, please make sure you're going out to vote in your uh, local um, elections. Um, they're going on right now, especially like here in Georgia, Virginia, um, you know, across the country. So make sure you're voting for school board and, and, you know, all the municipalities, you know, anything on the ballot, make sure that you're aware and that you come out to vote. 
So again, if you have any comments, show ideas, guest suggestions, please email me at grassrootsvoices999 at gmail.com. And I will do my best uh, to, you know, listen to your suggestions and see if I can bring on some of the recommended guests or cover some of the topics that you all suggest. If you want to support the show, you can send grassroots donations, $3, $5, $10, if you want. Um, some people like to donate and support in that way. You can Venmo me or PayPal me. Um, this show takes a lot of work, time, and energy. But I, again, I do it as a labor of love. I do it because it's important and because I know so many fabulous people like Bev Jackson, Jackson, Lauren Frazier, and so many others that I've interviewed who are out here doing the, the real work every day um, on the ground in the communities. So I want to do my best to support them, which was the intention of the, sh of the show. So if you want to send a grass roots donation, you can. Otherwise, another way you can support is to like and share this episode, tag a friend in the comments, uh, join our groups, my uh, my group, Team Stacey Abrams Grassroots, and all the other um, sister groups that I mentioned. Uh, again, check the comment section and join those groups. And please keep fighting for voting rights. Call your senators, let them know that you're paying attention and that we need both um, pieces of legislation on voting rights passed um, as soon as possible. So please call today because they are going to start um, speaking on the floor, um, on the Senate floor tomorrow, or I don't know if it's on the Senate floor or if it's being introduced. Um, I forgot what I said earlier. Uh, the cloture, I believe. Yeah. Cloture has officially been filed on the Freedom to Vote Act, and it will be brought to the Senate floor on Wednesday. That's what Senator Warnock um, tweeted. So again, please call your senators. And uh, what I'll do is I'm going to leave us today. I'm going to finish um, playing Senator Warnock's uh, speech um, about a week ago when um, they introduced the um, John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And then I'll see everybody next week with vote writers. Think of... Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in her dissenting opinion, when that decision came down, she said throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. We threw away our umbrella and we have found ourselves in the midst of a torrential rainstorm. Voter suppression laws mushrooming all over the country. We are witnessing right now what happens to our democracy <laughs> without the protections of preclearance and the other vital provisions of the Voting Rights Act. The lack of robust voting rights protections has ramifications for every American, as we've seen efforts ramp up this year at passing sweeping state level voter suppression laws, not laws that only impact black people and people of color to be sure, but also students, seniors, whomever certain politicians are afraid of will somehow get in the way of their craven march to power. And so this bill, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, is about Congress finally doing its job, finally doing what the Supreme Court asked us to do in 2013. Should have been done long time ago. The updated Voting Rights Advancement Act we're introducing today restores the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It strengthens our democracy by reestablishing preclearance, and it makes it better by updating it <clears throat> to also protect against specific practices we know suppress the vote, like polling place closures and new types of voter roll purges happening not only in the South, but all over the country. Our bill also restores Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to protect minority <laughs> communities from discriminatory voting practices after the Supreme Court diminished Section 2 earlier this year. Mr. President, just like the Freedom to Vote Act, me and many of my colleagues introduced just a few weeks ago to set national standards for 
voting so every eligible voter's voice is heard. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act we introduced today is designed to meet future challenges and address additional anti-democratic efforts aimed at suppressing the vote all over our country. Since I was elected on January 5th, since that terrible day on January 6th when this very capital was assaulted, we've seen more than 400 proposals in 49 states. So the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act builds for us a fire station to protect against future fires. But the House of Democracy is already on fire. And so we need the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, but we also need the Freedom to Vote Act. We've got to put out the fire. We've got to build a fire station for future fires. Mr. President, I know there's a lot on our plate, but we can't waste any time getting these bills passed. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. John Lewis walked across a bridge in order to build a bridge to a new American future. We already had infrastructure. He understood that the infrastructure of our democracy was in trouble. And so he walked across a bridge in order to build a bridge. So the House has already passed a version of this act. And I know my friend, Senator Joe Manchin, has been having conversations about the Freedom to Vote Act with our friends across the aisle. We're, we're happy to talk to anybody on both sides of the aisle. A similar version of this legislation has been voted up by this chamber repeatedly in the past with strong bipartisan support. Some 16 Republican senators who were either here or in the House when it passed in 2006, 98 to zero, are here today. And I asked them, what's the difference? Voting rights are not just another issue. Voting rights are preservative of all other rights. Voting rights are about the foundation of our democracy. And I believe that if the world's greatest deliberative body can't find a way forward to get this done, history will judge us harshly and rightly so. Reinhold Niebuhr, said that humankind's capacity for justice makes democracy possible. But our inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. Mm -hmm. This work, this assignment, which we have right now, is both possible and necessary. We can do it and we must do it, it's the most important thing we can do this Congress. And I hope we'll do it now. <sighs> Sometimes it's just, you know, it's it was like a miracle that we were able to get Senator Ossoff and Senator Warnock in, in the Senate and then to see the crazy insurrection happen, you know, not even 24 hours later. But a lot of times people will look at it and it does seem very grim, you know, especially like we, you know, the conversation we just had. But at the same time, there is a lot of hope because it means that we're making progress, which is why we're seeing the backlash. So we have to continue to push again, pushing President Biden to keep the pressure up uh, to get rid of the filibuster, keep pressuring the Senate, you know, for, for, for them to get rid of it. Um, we have to call our senators. We have to get out and vote. Voting is going on right now across the country, or it should be early voting should be starting everywhere no later than the next week or so. Um, we have to vote and then we have to organize and build these coalitions and keep up the fight because we are getting closer and closer to having the country that we want to have is, but it's like, we're, we're right, we're, we're so close. I know we've done a lot of work, but we just gotta keep on doing it. So again, thank you for joining me uh, uh, for Grassroots Voices. Again, my name is Robin. This is Grassroots Voices where community and politics meet. Um, I will be back here next week at 4 p.m. Um, October 26th on Tuesday to speak with vote writers and, and listening to how they are doing the work to help voters get IDs across the uh, country, specifically the battleground 
um, Sunbelt states. So thank you for joining me and have a wonderful day. Please like and share this episode, tag your friends and join all of our Facebook groups. Check out the links in the comments of the Team Stacey Abrams Grassroots Facebook group. So again, thanks again. Have a wonderful evening.